All right. Hey, guys, welcome back to the Melon Margin. I'm your host, Quavi Andre Williams. And I'm Daquan Wilson. And this is the talk show dedicated to bringing the marginalized to the spotlight and uplift the Black voices that will no longer stay silent. So let's get into this week's conversation. The misinformation in sex education. Now, Daquan, do you think that your sex ed classes educated you properly on what to expect from sex? The real question is, did they educate me, period? <laughs> like, I, if I have to think back to sex ed in like high school or whatever, I don't remember a single thing from it. Like, literally, I can't even tell you what the teacher's voice sound like. The only thing I really remember is watching some like videos or some documentaries or something like that, that we just like basically fell asleep to. Like, I don't think I actually learned a single thing. I fully agree, nothing at all. Like sex education really is bare bones, like all, and I think a lot of it comes from the Christian influences in our society because they're like, oh my God, sex is, and it's just, you can't talk about it. It's never to be discussed. And like, you will really see in so, it's in, in these classes, like I remember my sex ed class, but like I said, there was nothing that I learned from sex ed. Like none of it was good information. It was actually applicable to anything in my, like my, my, my life at the time. And I was like, you know, it was very much so fear tactics versus mm. educational if that makes any sense like it was very much so like don't do blah 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 blah. you can't it's blah 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 you get this you get that and it's kind of like it was very much so just kind of fear teaching versus actually trying to let people know what is going on and I think one of the biggest things that I thought about sex education was that my teacher flat out said in the beginning of the first day of class Daquan no bullshit this bitch got up in the, in the class and was like um I cannot answer any questions regarding lesbian or gay relationships at all. Period. Very interesting. Full stop, do not pass, go not collect $200. And me being in my grade, I was like, oh, 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 oh okay. okay. That's how it oh. is. <laughs> oh, so, not, so none of this is gonna apply to me is what you're saying. Basically is what I was hearing, cause I'm like literally, she said that we could not answer, we could not ask any questions related to gay sex or lesbian or any of that. That was just not on the chopping block to be discussed under no circumstances. And like I, for me growing up, especially in that time, like it was so, it was so, what's I'm looking for? It, it was, it was so depressing because like, you're like, well, school should be the one place where Emo where emotion, what, what is what I'm trying to for? It, where um personal beliefs, you know, shouldn't have a bearings on what you're taught. Right. You know what I mean? Like just because you don't agree with gay relationships or lesbian relationships or whatever the fuck, like it should have no bearings on educating students and people about what they should expect if they do go into the situation. Like I just, it was, it was the erasure for me. <laughs> was the erasure like the fuck there was no gay people in the class because i know i wasn't the only one mm -hmm. and i know i was the only one who was probably having questions about that they coined, what, is that something they talked about in your class too no <laughs> not at all like i growing up in the south like <laughs> it is what it is like education is already a thing you know south carolina consistently ranks pretty low in education but like in terms of like gay sexual education, like there was none of that. Like I, I don't remember a single thing about that. Um, and I do think that you bring up this important point in like, you know, regardless of whether you agree or not, like there are people in that class that needs that education and like they should be able to get education that is applicable to their experience and be able to be safe because otherwise you're perpetuating a system where you know, gay sex is stigmatized and there aren't the resources to learn about, you know, safe practices and, you know, especially with HIV and AIDS being such a prevalent issue in the community, like, it's important to be able to get the proper education. Um, but I do want to pass off this question of like, 
uh, where does this line between, you know, personal beliefs and sex ed come into play, specifically thinking about like, you know, parents and like religious backgrounds in terms of like, you know, certain religions are, you know, very much abstinence until uh, marriage. So do you think that there should be a way that like parents can opt out of certain parts of their student learning in a sex ed curriculum that may go against their religious or moral beliefs? Like, can they opt out their student, opt out their kids from the class? Yes. No, absolutely not. Under no circumstances do I think that they have that right. I think that this isn't a, this isn't like some additional class. This is an additional class. This is a required, this is a, this is as important, if not more important than math, English, and solid, all the all the all these other courses or whatever. It is it, it is an integral part of our lives. Every uh, mostly everyone's lives, uh, with the exception of people who are um uh, asexual or people who do not participate in sexual activity, for the most part, it is a very common thing. And even asexual people should probably should still be aware of these conversations just to know, you know, whatever. So like. I think that when it going back to your question, when it comes to them being able to pull their student, their kids out of that, no, because this is not like you can't pull your student out of a math class. You can't pull your student out of a, 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 a English class because it does it, it doesn't agree with your belief systems. Like if you go back to what we learn in English class and if we learn about in science specifically, like in certain science classes, we talk about how the earth was made. Right. And spe specifically, I believe it's astronomy and stuff like that, like in certain classes like that or like in certain science classes, we learn um, about how the universe was created. There's like a whole documentary online that we watch every year uh, in like your um, in your class called like Planet Earth. You remember that one when they teach you how the Earth was kind of like formed and stuff like that. And I'm like, that's evolutionism. Like that's that's that. And I feel like if a Christian person can't pull their kid out because they don't believe that's how the world was made because they believe that God created the earth in seven days or whatever, you know, whatever. Like, I feel like we're not teaching kids Genesis in the school. You know what I'm saying? We're not teaching, I mean, except for Catholic schools. But I mean, like, we're not teaching kids, you know, um, that in, in science class. So I feel like when it, when it comes to sex ed, sex ed is a integral part of life, whether we want to believe it or not, whether we want, whether we, it's, I, could, I, equip, I equate it to like math and sciences and English is like in the sense that that's why I brought up the asexual because I'm kind of like, even though you may not use all the information that you learn, it's still integral to, to creating a, um, a well-rounded person. So even though I may not use probability and statistics or certain math things like the, the PEMDAS and all that stuff like that, I still know how, I still am aware of it. You see what I'm saying? The same with sex education, like even if someone isn't participating in sexual activity, even if they are, even if they are absent or they're religious or whatever the case may be, they still need to be aware of what sex is, how to be safe during sex, and how to um, how to protect yourself. Because one of the main things for me, one of the main misconceptions I had about gay sex growing up was that um, for the first year when I learned about sex ed. Um, I think I was in, I want to say sixth, seventh grade. I don't know how it was, but it was in, it was kind of in that age range where we had the sex education class. And I remember distinctly um, thinking that because I was gay and couldn't get anyone pregnant, that I didn't have to use a condom to have sex. I thought that because in the classes, all they teach you is pregnancy and STDs. And in the videos that I was seeing, it was only straight couples or heterosexual couples or heteronormative couples. So like when I was looking at that, I was like, oh, well, I don't see two men having STDs. So, you know, I'm good. You know what I mean? And it wasn't until I got a, um, a, uh, a phone of my own and when I, when I had like a, 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 um, a, a keyboard phone or whatever, and I could actually go on, you know, look it up in Google. I was like, oh no. Oh, I can't do that. But my the scariest part about it is that at Daquan, that was my belief for like at least all the way up until about halfway through seventh, eighth grade. And my thing is the scariest part for me is what if I had a boyfriend at the time? Right. What if I had someone who was pressuring me to having sex at the time? Because this is happening. Like, and what it, what I shudder to think what what would happen to me if I hadn't figured out what I figured out, if I hadn't done myself, my own self research. Like Daquan, are there any misconceptions about sex that you had when you were um when you were growing up? 
Yeah, I think that like like you uh did not know anything, did not learn anything, and it was just one of those things where it's like, oh yeah, condoms are used for people not to get pregnant. We're not getting pregnant, yeah. but like <laughs> don't need one. Um yeah. But yeah, I think that there are a lot of like misconceptions that happen through omission. It's one of those, yes. things, like you were saying, like, oh, I'm not seeing this happening to people who look like me. So it shouldn't be a problem because nobody is saying that it's a problem. And then when it does become a problem, then you're like, oh, well, like I didn't know. Um, and I think that's why it's so important to have these materials be available regardless yes. where, whether you stand on a point or not. And I think even beyond that, I think that we need to be looking at sex education from a more comprehensive approach. It needs to be a way more comprehensive curriculum. One that yes. like not only talks about, you know, condoms and pregnancies and like physical sex, um, but also like what are the emotional parts of sex? What are healthy sexual relationships? what is and what is not consent to sex. All of these different things that are wrapped up in your sexual health and your sexuality should be talked about, as well as, you know, LGBTQ plus issues, as well as things about trans people and, you know, understanding different forms of gender identity and sexuality within a comprehensive sex education program. But I'll pass it back to you. What do you, what do you wish sex education was? Absolutely agree 100%. I don't know if you saw my finger wagging. If you listen to baby, I was wagging my finger the whole time they were talking. This right here is exactly what we need because my sex education class was one semester, not even a full semester. And not even, it was, and it was actually um, an addition. So it wasn't like a part of the regular PE curriculum. It was like, it was like the last four weeks we talked about sex ed and that was it. Yeah. And I was I like, and, Go ahead. I had something similar. I had, we had a health class. Yeah. And I think sex ed was a part of the health class, but it wasn't like a full class by itself. It was one of those things that like you took health for like a quarter. Yeah. And, yes. Yeah. It For like nine weeks. And then a couple of those weeks were about sex, sex ed, ed. And stuff like that. And it was like way too little a time to talk about it. And that's what I'm saying. Like, I fully agree with what you're saying. I think that we need to take, we need to really educate our, like, this is the reason why sex is a problem. That why consent is such a big, a big uh, topic of conversation. Why pressuring someone is such a big topic of conversation now. Why um, teen pregnancy is such a big conversation right now and still is even after all this time. It's because we are not educating our 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 um youth about proper sex habits and what is good what is i mean i'm sorry I'm just I'm, this is so frustrating to me because there is so much about sex that is all about the physical and 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 all about the and all about just the, the act itself versus really going into the emotional connections that come from sex and the the um not because it's like you said it, it's all about pregnancy STDs and that's it that's it and it's like we're not talking about how to properly ask someone or pro first of all properly pleasure someone because you know that we learn about the vagina but the the the, the men in the are supposed to learn about the vagina and we literally only learn about the uterus but most men don't even know what a clitoris is or, or don't know how to find it or what to do with it most men in the class they do not teach you how to put a condom on they don't teach you that that responsibility falls on you. They don't teach you what that looks like, what a condom is. First of all, knowing what your size is. I don't think I saw a condom until college. Bitch, I haven't seen one yet. <laughs> now I've seen it on TV and movies and shit, but I've never, I'm, you know what I'm saying? Like this is, this is stuff that I should have learned. This is stuff that should not have been my responsibility as a kid to learn on my own. You see what I'm saying? Like this, this is stuff that should be a comprehensive course. Like you're saying, it should be a full quarter course, a full, not a quarter, a full semester course that really goes in depth with not just the physical, not just the STDs, but also letting people know that first of all, let's be real. They having sex. Let's just, let's just get out of the way. 
Like, people are having sex at all ages at this point. It's, it's crazy. They shouldn't be. But the people are having sex at multiple at different age ranges right now. And at my, at my age in sixth grade, seventh grade, there are people all busting it open. I mean, there was just... I knew I people about you, in middle school that had children. Like, so it's people are... I think the whole... It's, it's the... It's the bird box for me because like we just want to act like people ain't out here fucking and because we have not had real conversations with these uh with these teenagers because we have not really sat down and said all right you know what this is a safe space and of course people who are gay are not probably going to be feeling comfortable enough to talk about being gay or or what that or, or um or what that might mean or asking those questions i always said like why not do the fishbowl like everybody puts a question in and it's just at random and, and, the, and the teacher every day, if you had a question about sex, you put it in, a, in the fishbowl every day and your teacher can sit up there and go through the fishbowl and be like, all right, this is a question, blah, 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 blah. This is the answer. I don't know who asked this question, but I'm going to answer this question as, as best as I can. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. set, gay stuff, gay sex, trans women, trans men, like understanding that kind of stuff, understanding, understanding the true spectrum of all the things that sex entails versus just standing on the physical i just i feel like that is such a problematic viewpoint in our society that we seem to think that people are not out here doing stuff and the reason why people are not getting educated the reason why there is so much teen pregnancy and there's so many stds and, they, and they, i had this one um this one person that commented on this when i was talking about this before about my story about how um you know i didn't know about what condoms were and if they didn't apply to us well, this person that commented on my video when I talked about it, they were kind of like, um, I think this is probably a lot, a lot of the reason why the AIDS pandemic was such a big thing back in the day. Because most gay people were not, gay Gay wasn't even a topic in, in school. So like all of these gay people probably had no idea, some gay, not all of them, but some of them probably didn't thought the same thing I thought. Right. Yeah, and it's such a big issue in terms of just like, not only this misinformation, but this lack of information. And it's one of those things that it comes from this problematic view that like abstinence only education is the only way. It's the only way you can teach sex ed. Yeah. Uh, but like, I personally think that, like I said before, we need a comprehensive sex ed curriculum for students. Yeah. Abstinence only is not enough. It's one of those things that there are literally research studies that show that teaching people abstinence only does not decrease uh, teen pregnancy, does not decrease or uh, demotivate teenagers from having sex. It does not do any of the things that like we tell, talk about it doing. So it's one of those things that like, we just need to move on. We need to acknowledge, like you said, that people are having sex, that people are doing it at all different types of ages and be able to have a curriculum where it's like, all right, if you choose to do this, not yes. encouraging you to do this, not saying you can't do like whatever you do is between you, your parents, your own beliefs, whatever. But if you choose to do this, here are the things you need to know. Here are the ways you can be safe. Here are the things you need to avoid. Yes, I fully agree. And I wonder I want to touch back on what you were saying a couple a couple of seconds ago. Um, people. When you tell teenagers not to do something, that only makes them more curious as to why they shouldn't do it. And it's, it's, it's classic teenage rebellion. It's classic, it's, it's textbook psychology. It's when you tell someone, don't press the red button, you kind of, the first thought in your head is, I, I wanna press the red button. <laughs> why not? Why not? Based, and that's exactly what's happened with sex. Don't have sex abstinence never 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 and then if the first thing you're thinking is well i want to have sex i want to <laughs> see what that is about i do what the, <laughs> what you gonna do about it though <laughs> what you gonna what's popping <laughs> but like seriously and that's what i think people don't understand i want to touch on this thing too in germany do you know the jake the drinking age in germany is 16. yeah but like the duis in germany are far lower than they are in america Right. And one of my um one of my uh, classmates a while back when I was in um college told me he was like the reason why we aren't like it's not as bad in Germany is because we don't it's not something that's like a thing like it's not like 
oh, oh, we drink and we're, we're rebelling. We're different. It's kind of like we just drink and we just have a good, we have a good time and that's what it is, but we're not drinking to die. You know what I mean? And it's kind of like, you know, <laughs> but like, it was just funny to me because I was like, wow, like they combated the thing because it's, it's not, it's not, it's not uh, what's I'm looking for? It's not rebellion if everybody if, if it's not illegal. You see what I'm saying? It's, it's not something different if it's not like if it's not discouraged. You know what I'm saying? It's not something people want to do. So like when you're 16 drinking, it's not like it's not like oh yeah, like I'm doing something bad. I'm bad. I'm rebelling. It's like girl, you drinking? Like everybody doing it? Like what are you talking about? It is. It is yes, and I think that's the same thing with sex. The reason why I think that sex education is actually do- counterproductive to what the goal they're trying to do is. Like, because they are so adamant about not discussing sex, that's why people are having sex. Right, and you're also allowing room for rumors and false information to spread. Because if they're not getting it from their teacher and their parents aren't talking to them, they're gonna ask their friends. And you know teenagers love to make up stories to sound like they know everything. And that's how you get all of these myths about sex and how it spreads and how so many different misconceptions are so common. Absolutely. And I cannot tell you, Daquan, how many women have told, uh, I, I heard back in the day were like, you know, if it's in the butt, it's not, it's not, it's not really sex. It doesn't count. It's kind of like, what the fuck? Like, as an adult, you're like, oh my God, no, oh my God. Like that, all of that is, what are you doing? But like back then as a kid, you're kind of like, that sounds about right. You know what I'm saying? Like, and it's crazy because there's so many people out here with misinformation and they think they're so, they think they're correct because no one is, they're not able to be corrected. And I think that what people don't, if you demystify sex, it takes out all the quote unquote um, excitement out of it. The whole danger out of it, you know what I mean? Because that's what it feels like, something dangerous. You know, like, oh, oh, I'm an adult, like, I'm doing a thing. Because that's what I've seen a lot of times. And there have been so many, if, if you demystify the act of sex and you demystify it, like, let's be completely candid and open about it, people wouldn't be jumping over hoops to have it. If women and men both knew what real consent was, informed consent was, I think, there, I think, I think so many uh, sexual har- harassments and stuff like that will go down so much if, pe- if people would educate people at, at young ages. Because once again, like you said before, if you don't tell your friend, like if you, if you don't find out the, um, from your teacher, you're gonna find out from your friends. Mm-hmm. And where a teacher could, could nip in that whole like pressuring someone to have sex is not okay in the bud, your friend will be like, oh yeah, you can tell them and then uh, you can just convince them to do it and then they'll be fine, that's not, that's fine, that's okay. Because you're not getting the correct information. You're not getting the proper information. Demystify sex and it becomes less the monster in the closet kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Or even just like, you know, going back to that idea, like, oh, if it's not vaginal, then it's not sex. Like, that's how people have misconceptions about rape. They're like, oh, it was oral, so it's not. Yeah, it was anal. So it wasn't rape. It was a hand job. So it wasn't. But in reality, all of those things are sexual assault. Yeah, that's another part that needs to be in our sexual education curriculums for like many different ages, because it's one of those things that it happens so frequently. And there's not like an age where it's like, okay, people start doing these things or having these ideas. It's like, everybody matures at different levels. Everybody has urges at different times in their lives. So I think that like, we really need to focus on making sure that we are, you know, educating people and, you know, while they are still young, while their brains are still malleable so that they can pick up on this information and not go out into the world, go out into college with all of these misconceptions about sex and then be like, well, fuck it. But like, and seriously, and the, and the crazy part is we don't discuss this. Like the whole thing is that we don't even talk about sexual assault in those classes and realizing that sexual assault can happen to both men and women and that women can pressure men into having sex too. What, it may not be as common or maybe not as, as, whatever, as, as, um, as prevalent as men pressuring women, but it still can happen. Like men can pressure other men. Women can pressure other women. It is, it is it's pressure in general. It doesn't, it knows no sex or gender. And I think that 
we have so many, I, we, there's, this, there's this toxic idea out in the world that men can't get raped. Or that if you get raped and you are a man, or if you get sexually assaulted and you are like, Daquan, I cannot tell you how, I, I remember a very distinct memory of a kid when I was younger um, saying that a girl in the class was like rubbing and touching all over him, right? And like his brothers were like, oh yeah, you ain't a virgin no more. Ha, 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 cool, right, cool, right? And the kid was just so like quiet about it. And it broke my heart, Daquan, because I realized in that moment that that child felt like, because it, it, it was somebody in his class, like another, another classmate, but that, that child mm -hmm. felt like his fear and pain was invalid because everyone else around him is telling him that that's okay. That what happened was okay when it wasn't. Right. You know, when it broke, and you know what I'm saying? It really broke my heart. Cause I'm like, you know, I, I couldn't do anything about it, but I was just, cause I, like I said, I heard it through the, you know, heard it through whatever, but it was just crazy. Cause I was like, oh my God, like, are we, are we, and I, and I, you know, uh, of course I tried to say something. He was kind of like, I don't really want to talk about it. I'm like, you know, that's, you know, you know, okay, I got you. But like, I just realized that like this, is what people are doing. Like to little boys and whatever, like people are not realizing that they can be sexually harassed. They can be sexually assaulted. And, a and even if it is another little girl doing it, it doesn't matter. Not at they all. They touched a place in their body that they didn't want them to touch. And the fact that that little kid realized that not, only, not, his, not even his brothers were recognizing the problem of what happened. Not his brother was telling him, we are so sorry that happened. Let's let's speak to whoever what happened. Let's get the situation. Let's let's validate your pain. They completely disavowed it as if it was not even existing. It was and it was because it was a girl who did it. Because it was a girl who did it. His age, it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't assault and it wasn't it wasn't a problem. Do you see what I'm saying? When it fully was. Like do you do you hear what I'm saying, Daquan? Like does that make sense? Yeah, I fully agree. And I'm thinking about another uh, instance. Uh, where I heard something similar and was heartbroken because it was one of those instances where people kind of spread these rumors about like how, oh, if you get aroused, then it's not rape. And it's like, that's also a problematic misconception <laughs> because like there's nerves. Nerves yes. are gonna react to stimuli, stimuli regardless yes. of certain things. Uh, so it's one of those things that I think that it, it's so heartbreaking that it happens. And especially at such a young age. Formative age. Yeah, so it's, you know, something that I'm thinking about now is like, is there a too early stage to have sex education? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. There's no, there's, there's no early, because like you said before, people develop at different ages. We were taught, Daquan, I bullshit you not. We we're hearing about sex. And I distinctly remember in second grade, having, hearing one of my friends talking about going and having sex in the bathroom with her friend or whatever the case may be and whatever, whatever. And I realized, I was like, I don't know what the fuck is going on because I never heard it. But once again, we're forgetting that every single child, especially in public schools or any school, period, that they are all exposed to different things in their lives. And some kids are exposed to sexual activity at a very, very young age. And there are so many little girls and little boys who don't know how to voice their discomfort where something sexual happens that they don't understand is sexual. Like they said, I, I remember hearing the story about a woman who said that her daughter was like something about a cookie jar or something like that or whatever, whatever. Like it was something like that. And, and they were, have you heard the story? I don't think so. Well, basically she was like, well, there's this guy who keeps taking my cookies or whatever, whatever the case may be. And she's like, oh, like, you know, mama just didn't understand. She's like, oh yeah, cookies, whatever, whatever. It turns out the little girl was talking about her private parts, but she was using the term cookies to describe it. 
And it was like a year after the mom found out or a couple months after her daughter had been being, you know, molested or taken, you know, whatever. And they were like, oh, she just, she, cause she never put two and two together. She could never figure out what her daughter was talking about. Cause all the dialogue she had was cookies and blah, 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 and no, no, and whatever, whatever. She didn't know what it was called. And I think that that is also a problem is giving all of these um, pet names to things. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like everybody's like, oh, my kid can't know about this. It's like, bitch, listen. Telling someone that they have a vagina, telling someone they have a penis, these are the biological terms. These are the terms that we have to educate our youth in so that they know when someone, when your, when your daughter says, hey, this person touched my vagina. Hey, this person touched my penis. Hey, this person touched my breasts or my chest. You see what I'm saying? Like knowing what these terms are called and not giving it a cutesy name is a way to help give people the power and give children the autonomy to be like, mom, this is what happened. And either they can't say the whole word, or don't, you know what I'm saying? Like it, right. it, as long as they, as long as a mom can hear what the fuck, as long as it sounds something like that, you know what I mean? And I think that that's the biggest problem is that we are hiding our kids. We're sheltering them and we're not realizing, Daquan, I was in second grade and we were talking about sex. Second grade, Daquan. Yeah, same here. Like I remember probably somewhere around early elementary school, you know, people were talking about touching each other's private parts and stuff like that. And it, again, it's one of those things that like, uh, you know, when you were talking about how people don't have the language, I always think about like when they do the doll test and it's like, oh, point on the doll where they touched you. Um, but I do think that like, it's important to give people the language because it's anatomy. It's a human physiology. Yes. Like it's perfectly fine to say, e or even if you didn't want them to say that word, you know, using something where it's like private parts, like that's, you know, yeah, different enough, but like you still know what it is when yeah. you start getting into the pet names or like the cookie or the. Uh, that's when it's just like it sets a precedent. Situations and it's suppressing. Yeah, it it sets a precedent. It sets a bad precedent because when you give it pet names like that, it's like other people may not know that that's the pet name for it. You see what I'm saying? Right. Like if you tell your daughter that her vagina is a cookie or it's like my cookies or whatever, whatever, and something happens at school and she tries to tell the teacher, hey, that kid touched my cookies. And you're and the teacher's like, oh, well, you know, it's okay, you know, just share it, you know, whatever, whatever. She, I mean, I, I, I'm using, a, I'm using a, 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 a metaphor here, you know, but I'm just saying like, the teacher does not know that the mom has taught her daughter that that's what she calls that. So the teacher's not going to report that to her mother. Do you see what I'm saying? Right. Like it's, that's a bad precedent. Like you said, I do fully agree that if you don't feel like saying vagina or whatever, if that's too much, like you said, saying my private, my private part of my private area, but these pet names and shit like that, she needed to be dead. It's, it needed to be dead in because like the reality is, we are, these kids are already knowing about what the fuck is going on. They may not know fully or understand fully, but they see it. And so they need to have the proper language or dialogue. It needs to be uniform too. Like we need to say, all right, kids, this, that, and that, these are private areas. Also teaching your kids consent. You cannot touch these person's private areas without their permission. That is not okay. And I wanted to ask you too, Daquan, even moving forward with that, because oftentimes it's mostly women or girls who are told um, to call their part certain things, whereas men, it's not the same thing because I was told that my part was a penis. You know what I'm saying? Whereas my sister was taught that hers or her ninny, her little whatever, like it was a different cutesy word. So I want to ask you, do, we, do you think that sex education is sexist? Yeah, 100%. I think that like a lot of what we talk about puts the burden of sexual... Um, Ma I'm trying to think of the word for it, but like modesty, there we go. Such okay. Modesty has to be come from the woman. You know, we don't, we, we police women more than we police men when it comes to mm. things about sexual education and sexual health. Um, or even just like, as we talk about sexual education terms, like how we focus so much on like pregnancy and you know, STDs, and it's always in the context of, like, 
women getting them. I don't know if you notice that, but like rarely have I heard, you know, situations yeah. like men getting STDs or uh, anything like that. Or if it is, it's like, oh, well, like they pass it on or something. I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I do think that there is this gendered bias in sex, sex education. And that just goes back to how our society views women and views this like patriarchal role of sex. I think that patriarchy has fucked over women consistently and still to this day. And it's it's astronomical, huh? You can say that again. I mean, seriously, it is astronomical how much women have, have been and are still being fucked over today. And I think that what is crazy, what is crazy to me is that, Daquan, have you ever seen the abstinence ceremonies where like the fathers take the daughters to like dance and certain things and they like make a promise to their father not to have sex or whatever and they stay virginal or whatever and they have to sign a contract and shit. Those and don't like, work by the way. Absolutely yeah. not, like obviously not. <laughs> but I'm just saying like, we make such a big to-do about women staying virgins or remaining virgins and men, I don't, I have not seen one ceremony at all where a man is told, all right, son, now you don't go around having sex and blah, 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 blah. And like, it's crazy. Like, it's just, it's crazy how we have, this is normal. Like, this is normal to be like. It's one of those things where like, women are supposed to protect their virginity while men, it's celebrated. Like, oh, you got rid of your, like, look at you being a ladies man. Ah, it's, it's when a, when a, when a dad finds out that his son has lost his virginity, it's a moment of pride. But when a father finds out that his daughter, like, did you remember that story about T.I. checking his daughter's hymen? Ridiculous. Ridiculous. Checking his daughter's hymen to make sure that she is still a virgin? Are you for real? Even though it's known that sex isn't the only way a hymen can break. Oh, uh-huh. uh-huh. Another failure of sex education. Another failure of sex education. But that's Daquan. He was checking his daughter's hymen. Just let's let that sink in for a second. But I guarantee that he ain't got no problem with his sons going out and getting out of vagina in the world, right? <laughs> gotcha. No. And that's what I'm saying. Like they put even even in Daquan, it goes even deeper than that. Even look at our medical system, how the only two options, excuse me, three options that a man can do, or a, excuse me, or a person with a penis um, can do to avoid um, pregnancy or ST, uh, 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 per, per, uh, avoid pregnancy is the coitus interruptus pullout method, condoms, and a vasectomy. Those are the only three options. Whereas women, there is, I mean, there is every single thing in the sun to help them not because uh, to, to stop them from getting pregnant. I'm kind of like, you're putting the responsibility solely on the woman doing stuff like that. Why are there not pills for men to keep them, them shoot, to shoot blanks? You see what I'm saying? Why are there not, you know, things that we can get injected on our arm or like things that we can get put, you know what I'm saying? Like, why are there, why are there not, um, what is it, contraceptives for men that put the responsibility on them as well because the responsibility as our society teaches it is solely on women. And that is not the case because it takes two people to make a child. You know what I mean? Like it's just, and then, and then Daquan, periods. Why the fuck, why the fuck is that such a, something that just could not be discussed? Like just cannot be discussed. That, that's, that's one of the things that like, is such a problem because like, I remember it was like fourth or fifth grade, they separated all uh, all of the students, like boys and girls, which separating students by gender is problematic by itself, but (laughs) that's another episode. But they separated the boys and girls to talk about puberty and like the changes in their body and stuff like that. And it's like, I, I, I do think that it's important for both or 
not even both because there's so many different genders. It's important for everybody <laughs> what's going on in their bodies and what's going on in other people's bodies because you never know like what type of situation you're going to be in. Like it's one of those things that like for so long I did not understand periods at all. It was just like oh like y- y'all just bleed and go crazy. <laughs> like what is that? Like. <laughs> why, why? <laughs> like I was so just like uninformed about everything but it's so important and I think like going back to what you were saying earlier of like how we need to start teaching people things earlier like if I'm old enough to learn about puberty and learn about the like sexual changes in my body I also am old enough to learn about consent I'm also old enough to learn about all of these different things that comes with sex um So I do think that it needs to be something where we need to be able to talk about these things and not just like separate people and like try to create all of these casts. Absolutely. I fully agree. And I want to talk, I want, and I want to clarify what we're talking about. Like, I think that the way it should work is a leveled graduated system. So like, Mm -hmm. of course, we're not going to tell first graders, this is how you put on a condom. Like, we're not like, you know, that's not what we're saying, but I do believe that every step up, there should be more and more information given. So like maybe in the beginning stages, like elementary school, we teach about consent. Yeah. I can hug you. I cannot hug you. If someone says no to hugging you, that's okay to say. You're not a problem. Don't let anybody pressure you into a hugging or touching something that you don't want to touch. Or like you said before, learning about what a period is. Because that's something that women have to be dealing with probably usually uh, right around the middle school years. So elementary school, it should be a precursor like, hey, women have periods and that's okay. Women, uh, uh, that, that might happen though, like letting, uh, letting men know, uh, letting, uh, peop- um, letting people know what that is and what that entails and understanding that and understanding, demystifying, demystifying it. So it's not a something that's completely unknown because so many men, even if even fucking grown ass men, even people in high school, like you hear like, oh my God, like, what is this? Why is she bleeding? Oh my God. Like, it's like a whole weird grossed out situation. It's kind of like, bitch, this is, bitch, you shit. Everybody shit, everybody pee. Everybody, everybody has thrown up before. Like, so this is like normal shit. So like, I don't understand why the fuck people are so confused about that. Like, I remember the first time I talked to my sister about periods and my mom or whatever. I was like, girl, just tell me the tea. You, did you know? Did you know that pen, like premenstrual cramps or, man, or menstrual cramps happen in sleep too? Yeah. That shit shook me. <laughs> I said, I was talking to my sister and I was like, so like, do you get like cramps in your sleep? She's like, yeah, it wakes me up. And so I'm like, wake you up? Bitch, you can't even go to sleep? She's like, no. I'm like, ah. Uh-huh. She's like, yeah, I'll go to sleep and then I'll have a period crap. I wake up. Oh my God, it hurt. And then go back to sleep. I'm like, not waking you up. Mm-hmm. I thought you could go to sleep and it'd be done. She said, no, baby, that's not how that works. But like, we were just having, me and my my mom and my sister, we just sat down and had an honest conversation about periods. And like, when I asked my sister, when I talked to my sister about it, because I'm like, you know, you know, is there anything you need me to do? Like, what do you need from me? Like, can I help you in some way? Like, you know, do you need something to, you know, whatever, like any way I can help? Like my mom, my mom, uh, my mom too. Like, you know, if I can get like, you know, whatever food you want, whatever, whatever, or like just being able to be um, more sensitive in that time because their hormones are imbalanced, you know, and understanding that, okay, you know, I don't want it. It makes I'm gonna make sure that I'm uh, extra sensitive in this time frame. So let me know so I'm I'm not like me and my sister. We mess around a lot. We, we um we fight with each other a lot. Like you know, physically, whatever. You know what I'm saying? Like just like having fun. Like you know, just you know, brother sister shit. You know what I mean? Right. And like you know, um, I would always ask. I'm like, hey, are you in a period? Because I don't want to. You know, I don't want to. You know, push or hit something. And then like, you know what I mean? It's like it'll hurt, it'll hurt you, or you'll like, you know, it'll it'll um affect what you got going on. She's like, yes, and she'll be like, hey, bitch, I got my periods. So I'm like, don't talk to me, don't don't fuck me this month, like, but not this month, but don't fuck me this week because I got this going on. I'm like, okay, got you. So you off limits right now, but bitch, I'm a comfort. I'm, I'm beating that ass on Monday morning, you know. But like, <laughs> but like, you know, that's how we do it. Like when we when um when we're like playing like rough housing, that's what that's what I'm looking for. Right. Rough housing around or whatever. Like I know that I can't mess with her in certain times. So like having that open dialogue with my sister and my mom and my family and like having that open dialogue probably in people too, like understanding that like, you know, saying stuff like, are you on your period is like a offensive derogatory, like way of uh, talking to women. You see what I'm saying? 
it's it's fully patriarchy, but we don't understand. We don't we don't see that because we're not taught that that's something that's normal. That's that that hormone imbalance is not every not every woman gets angry. Not every woman gets sad. It's different for everybody, and it's not about every woman gets a period. Hey, that, period. <laughs> not every woman gets a period. Period. Like honestly, so like it's just it's crazy to me how we aren't having those conversations because once again, having that conversation with my sister helped me be a better brother to her. You know what I'm saying? Having ha- having having that um conversation with her helped me understand her better. So like when I would be playing with her before and she'd be like getting mad at me, I'm like, bitch, what the fuck? Like I'd be mad as fuck. And she was like, no, I'm on my period right now. So that when you, you know, whatever I get, I'm, I'm you know, whatever. So I'm like, oh shit. So I can't, I can't, you know, I can't choke this bitch. I'm like, <laughs> right. I can't, I can't, I can't body slam this bitch. You know what I'm saying? She can't body slam me. You know what I mean? Like, but that's just that's just how we, you know, that's how we um that's how we play that's how we that's how we um you know have our you know whatever like so it's just having that open discussion with her helped me understand her better especially when we're younger so like you know as an adult when i fuck with her too i'd be like when i be wondering you know when we fighting or whatever like oh you know bitch wait a minute now i don't want you know whatever so it made made me a more sensitive person you see what i'm saying and i think that like something that you're getting at is why we need comprehensive sex education is because you know, sexual education applies so much more broadly than just sex. It applies to friendships. It applies to like all of these different relationships that we have with people. And if instead of stigmatizing these open dialogues, we had these open dialogues, we'd be able to understand people better. We'd be able to get along with people better and be able to have conversations so that we know how to interact with people during certain yes. times in certain ways. Like yes. you need to know how to like consent to somebody. You need to know like uh, another part of comprehensive sex education is also relationships, what a toxic relationship is, what a healthy relationship is and being able to like develop those interpersonal skills to where like you can be like, hey, this is not something I want right now or hey, like, I noticed that you're a little bit frustrated. What can I do to help? What would you want in this situation? Being able to have those conversations in all different types of relationships. Absolutely. It's about behavior modification. It's an adjustment. You know, just like when you're not feeling well and you tell someone, hey, guys, you know, I'm not feeling well today. So I might be a little different, whatever. It's the same thing with that. When me and my sister would play as kids, like I'd have to, I would just adjust my behavior when that time came around because I didn't want to further um, incite anything else when she's already going through, she, when she's already going through pain, I don't want to, you know, add on to her frustrations. You see what I'm saying? So like, it's about behavior modification. It's about, it doesn't mean that I can't play with my sister. It doesn't mean I can't fight with her or whatever, you know, when we, whenever, you know, when we rough house or whatever, but like, there's about, there's a time and place for it. And because she has, and because she has periods, that means that I have to adjust my behavior to us to accommodate her um her her issue you know her um her uh what is it called like I, that that situation you see what I'm saying so like the same thing goes with I feel like in society like I don't understand why women don't have seven days out of the month where they get paid like why isn't why can't you take paid leave for that because some women have very painful menstrual cramps. And they still have to go to work. They're still expected to go to work and to be at 100%. Patriarchy. Oh, uh, and it's like, and I mean, just look at the um the prices of feminine ca- uh, care products. You so know what I mean? Expensive. Or like men being, bitch, I, I have bought my sister um pads and, and t- I, I have bought the whole thing for my mom. My, I'm not, I'm, that shit never made me, you know, uncomfortable. But you would see a lot of times in the movies and TV shows, like if a man has to go to the store to get his girlfriend or his sister or his mom or his whoever, or uh, whoever uh, um, has, a, has a vagina, you know, and has periods, like having to get their stuff, it's a whole to do. Like, oh my God, I don't want nobody to see me. Like, bitch, what the fuck? It's a, it's a, what? And a lot of times they don't even know what it is. They don't know what it is, what it do, like what it look like. And it's one of those but things like, that we need that education. But my whole de- my whole point, Daquan, is like I don't even understand why it's a thing. Like, I'm, well, I know why it's a thing. Patriarchy, of course. But like, I'm just like, when I when I went to the store, my mom was like, "Hey, go in your go in there, get you some pads, or give me some pads." I'm like, "Okay, which one?" Like, you know what I mean? I was never like, well, "Let me hide it." Oh God, someone's gonna you see. Like the absorbency. Yeah. Like, is it a heavy flow or a light flow? Like, what are we what are we looking for in this? 
Like seriously, I, I, I like I, I just don't understand like the whole shame in men for taking care of or, or by male identifying people to take to take care of someone um, who has periods. Like I don't understand the shame in that. Like I don't, have, baby. I my sister, mom, what you need? What you need? How can I help? How can I make this a less a, a more comfortable experience for you right now? Because the shit you're going through is garbage. It's garbage. Right, because it's one of those things that it just gets back to this conversation we had before of how the burden of sexual things are always put on the women, the woman, or woman identifying people. And I think that like it leads to so many different conversations, like things we have on like abortion or oh. you know, women getting their tubes tied versus uh, vasectomies, which vasectomies are reversible. So like. You know, just just saying just putting that out there that you know if pregnancy was such a problem vasectomies are reversible you can have it and then reverse it when you know you're ready to have a child but that that's I, another conversation oh that's a whole nother day right there right but i, I wanted to talk about this too and i was kind of touching this we might this might be just a whole nother episode but like honestly and truly like like the thing that I've noticed, and I don't know if you heard this by this too, Daquan, but like there are so many women who I've had, you know, um, conversations with who have told me that their man has never made them orgasm. And I'm like, I'm sorry, excuse me. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, what? I, I'm, I'm, can you say that for me one more time? I didn't hear it real quick. They, I have had women tell me that they're like, they're too afraid because they don't want to make his ego feel bad. And I'm like, fuck his ego. Right. Fuck him. <laughs> We're not protecting men in 2021. Like, it really pissed me. And when I heard that, like, they were like, we just don't have the conversation. I'm like, you're telling me that you are more comfortable telling me about not having an orgasm, someone who can't help you with that because I'm not your man. Uh, I'm not your girl. Like, I'm not none of that. So, like, I can't do nothing for you. So, like, you're telling me this when you should be telling the person who is responsible for your orgasm. Like, and it just baffles me that women have this shame about like letting men know how to please them. Because a man don't, get, a, a, a man don't give a fuck about it. it, it huh. Once he's done, it's done. It's done. So like, I feel like, and, I, and I've had, and I, when I cannot tell you how many women have talked to me about this. How many people have told me that they just are too afraid to bring it up because they don't want to hurt their feelings? And I'm kind of like, but what about your feelings? Literally. <laughs> Literally. What about your pleasure? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, this is a two-way street. It's not just about pleasing that man. It's not about just pleasing the man. It's about the woman. But that goes back to patriarchy again, which is, once again, a whole other episode. But it just, it's just, like, have you had that experience with women I've told you about that too, Daquan? Like, have you heard that conversation before? Yeah, you know, being somebody's gay best friend, you hear about that all the time. And it's just one of those things that, like we said before, they're not taught about body parts. They're not taught about what is actually down there. So, you know, I've heard stories about, uh, you know, my girlfriends, you know, having sex with a guy and they go down and they don't know how to, they don't know where to go. They don't know, what to do. they don't know how to find the clitoris. And that's, that's, that's frankly embarrassing. Like, I mean, but also it's the miseducation. You don't need, we act like they don't need to know this. And then when they don't know this, we try to coddle their feelings. Or even the shame of like men being able to ask women, hey, is this good? Hey, do you need me to do something different? Like, it's this thing of like, like it's this weird thing in toxic masculinity that teaches men that you should just know. Oh, what? Like when you have sex, you're just supposed to know everything. You're supposed to know, you're supposed to go in, don't ask questions, just figure it out because you're a man and men don't ask questions. Men don't ask for directions. Literally, men don't ask for directions. So you don't ask for directions about how to please your woman. I'm like, oh, what the fuck? Nigga, that same shit you did with the other bitch ain't gonna work on this one. Like that same shit you did with the other nigga ain't gonna work on this nigga. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like that, every per, this is my thing, Daquan. This is how I, I firmly believe this. I don't care how many people you slept with. Every single person you sleep with is different. The same stroke game that you got for that person is not gonna work for this person. There is no uniform way to have sex. 
There is no uniform way to give a woman or a person with a vagina pleasure. There is not a uniform way to give a man or a person with a penis pleasure. There is no, there is no uniform way. There's no uniform way. Everybody is different. So I think that people need to recognize that every time you step into a new relationship, every time you step into new sex, it's new territory. Completely. And it's okay to be like, hey, listen, I'm trying to make, I mean, I think it's, I think the sexy, I, listen, I don't know about these other motherfuckers out here, but the, if your man come up to you or your, whoever, or your whoever come up to you and say, listen, baby, tell me how to please you. Oh, what you need tonight? Tell me how to please you. What you in the mood for? Like flooded. The basement is the fl flooded. Like I'm fl like, like that to me is so. That's sexy. Consider sexy. Asking someone how to make them feel good. That's sexy. But everybody's like, no, he needs to know how to bust this pussy open. Well, bitch, if you don't tell him, oh he, oh this, oh they need to know how to do. And they, she didn't know how to ride this dick. Well, bitch, if you don't tell her, <laughs> that's also one of. That's. A, this is a episode for another day, but it's like, oh, you want somebody to know how to ride your dick, but you also don't want them to have had sex before. Double standards. Double, Ooh, standards. double standards. That's gonna be an episode for season season three, right there already. Thank you, right there. Thank you for that, Nate Juan. That, that is absolutely a conversation. But yeah, I think honestly though, like the reality is in sex education. The reality is we should let people know. I think that in this life, we need to recognize and stop and take off the blinders and recognize that sex is happening regardless. And if people do not talk about it, does not mean, if just because you don't talk about it does not mean it is not happening. Right. Just because you do not talk about it does not mean it is not happening. Just because you don't talk about gay sex does not mean that somebody in this class is not gonna have gay sex. Just because you don't talk about sex or, or, or whatever does not mean somebody's not gonna have it. So the fact that we are still at, in 2021, we are still not at a place or at a point where we can discuss sex in honest, candid ways to let people know that, listen, y'all, I'm not encouraging you to or to not have sex. I'm going to give you the facts. I'm going to give you everything I can give you and all the information that you need so that when you step out into life, you know what you're getting into. You know what informed consent is. You know how to protect, you, you know how to please someone with the vagina or with the penis. You know what um what STDs are and how to prevent them. You know that condoms are not 100% effective. You know that there are there that that this um that sex requires certain different things for them. Like the fact is, we should we should definitely teach gay sex and the fact of like, hey, douching, hey, hey. And how to do that properly. And how to do so that. Many people get out there and they think, oh, I can do it every single day. And it's like, <laughs> you are literally tearing up your insides. <laughs> Listen, baby, this, this, this ain't move, this ain't TV, okay? Uh, you can't, this ain't how that, don't, don't listen to television, all right? That's not how. Well. But like, seriously, like we need to have these honest, candid conversations so that when people step out into the world, they know, hey, this is how you douche. This is how that works this is if you decide to ever do this. And I think that, again, like we said earlier, like I said earlier, graduated systems. When in elementary school, they shouldn't be talking about all kinds of crazy stuff and how to please or whatever, whatever. But they definitely need to know what these parts are called. They definitely know about consent. They definitely need to know about periods. And it definitely to know that their friends, their, their friends that happen to be girls might not be feeling up to you uh, fucking with her that particular week. You know what I'm saying? The same, thing, the same thing I do with my sister, letting her know like, hey, bitch, I want to fuck, I, I want to fight you today. She's like, bitch, I can't fight you. We're going we to pull up, on, pull up on me on next week. And I'm like, all right, bitch, bet. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you know, having that kind of dichotomy, having that kind of conversation. Talking right. to your friends like, hey, bitch, I want to fight with you today. Or hey, or, or, your, or if your girlfriend, like, you know, hey, you know, um, is there anything I could do extra for you today? Because I know you're going through some extra stuff like here. Like, just having these conversations, Daquan. Opening up these conversations so that people are fully educated about the realistic aspects of sex and what it entails in all forms. And that, and that includes teaching heterosexual people what gay sex is because it also demystifies it as well to them. Because there are so many straight men, bitch, I swear, I am not your gay dictionary, okay, nigga? I don't, I'm not, no, no. It's tiring. 
Don't ask like, questions. Like, honestly, like, bitch, Google the shit. Like, you know what I'm saying? It's the same thing with, like, trying to teach people about uh, racism. It's kind of like, Google the shit, bitch. Like, shit. You know, so, I don't know, Are we reaching the conversation today? I think we, we've reached a point to wrap up. All right, guys. So, um, as you always know, baby, there are so many little boys and girls grow up never knowing the full scope of what their culture has contributed to society and history. So it's time for a change, baby. Let's take a pause, rewind, and remind the world just how we did that. Now, in the article, little known Black History text written by PBS, we find out about more diverse history of historically Black colleges and universities. Now, while Jewish and African-American communities have had a tumultuous shared history when it comes to the pursuit of civil rights, there is often a chapter that is overlooked. In the 1930s, when Jewish academics from Germany and Austria were dismissed from their teaching positions, many came to the United States looking for jobs. Now, due to the depression, xenophobia, and rising anti-Semitism, many found it difficult to find work but more than 50 found positions at HBCUs in the segregated South. Now, originally established to educate freed slaves to read and write, the first of the historically black colleges and universities was Cheney University in Pennsylvania, established in 1837. Now, by that time, Jewish professors arrived the number of HBCUs had grown to 78. Now, at a time when both Jews and African Americans were persecuted, Jewish professors in the Black colleges found the environment more comfortable and accepting, often creating special programs to provide opportunities to engage Blacks and whites in meaningful conversation often for the first time. Now, in the years that followed, the interests of Jewish and African-American communities increasingly diverged, but this one once shared experience of discrimination and inter interracial cooperation remains a key part in the civil rights movement. And that further discusses what we've talked about before about realizing that white supremacy has so quickly separated us as communities, as Jewish communities, and African-American communities, Asian communities, like they keep us pitted against each other because they know that if we unite, we could fucking take over this shit. But because they keep us fighting amongst ourselves, we stay in the cycle of staying under the foot of white supremacy. Daquan? Yeah, and I think like th that entire story just like goes back to what you were saying, I think last week in terms of like allyship and being able to like have these connections with people across the color line and have these connections and understand what's at the root of the problem and what is creating these environments where people feel oppressed, where people feel persecuted and separated and all of these different things. So like you said before, white supremacy is the root of so many different evils. <laughs> Just about everything. I, I don't think I can not connect a problem to white supremacy somehow, but yeah, thank you so much for sharing. <laughs> thank you. All right, and on the topic of HBCUs, let's talk about Spelman College graduate, Marion Wright Edelman. Edelman was born on June 6, 1939 in Bennettsville, South Carolina. She began attending Spelman in 1956, and due to her academic achievement, she was awarded a Morrill Scholarship, which allowed her to travel and study abroad. In 1959, she returned to Spelman for her senior year and became involved in the civil rights movement. In 1960, she was arrested along with 77 other students during a sit-in at a segregated Atlanta restaurant. She graduated from Spelman as valedictorian and she went on to study law and enrolled in Yale Law School where she was the John Hay Whitney Fellow and earned a Juris Doctor in 1963. She was also a member of Delta Sigma Theta, a uh, historically Black uh, sorority. Edelman was the first African-American woman admitted to the Mississippi Bar in 1964, where she began practicing law with the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund's Mississippi office, working on racial and justice issues connected with the civil rights movement and representing activists during the Mississippi Freedom Summer of 1964. 
She also helped establish the Head Start programs, which a lot of us know today that provide comprehensive early childhood education, nutrition, health and parent involvement services for low income families. In 1973, she founded the Children's Defense Fund as a voice for poor children, children of color, and children with disabilities. The organization has served as an advocacy and research center for children's issues, documenting the problems and possible solutions to children in need. And as a leader and principal spokesperson for the CDF, Edelman worked to pursue, to persuade the United States Congress to overhaul foster care, support adoption, improve childcare and protect children who are disabled, homeless, abused and or, and or neglected. And I just wanted to bring Marion Wright Edelman because I always think of her quote, you can't be what you can't see. And Edelman for mm. so many people was, some, was like a trailblazer somebody who done so much to make sure that people, especially children, were able to achieve, were able to succeed in whatever things possible. And she made, she made so many different paths for people to see themselves in positions that they could have never saw before. That is very powerful. I think that Black women. Black women. <laughs> black women. I mean, I mean, you've done it again constantly rising the bar. <laughs> like black women are the shit. Like honestly and truly like that is amazing. And I mean, I didn't like you can't be what you can't see. Representation, she was the first representation matters. Like saying that like in a, in a certain way like that, like one of the first, like that, that is true. Like you really can't be, if you can't, if you don't see people that look like you, if you, if you don't see people in positions that you want, then you think I can't be in that position because then that's somebody that looks like me. Representation even matters. Even if you don't see anybody doing that, if you can't see yourself on the path, if you see yes. obstacles and blocks in front of you and you can't see the path to that success. She did, I have to give it a, she did that baby. She, she said, that. baby, she said, what did she do? That, she <laughs> pop off black women constantly raising the bar every time. I love it when black women I mean, I love black women, but this period. <laughs> just, I love you when have black a women episode I, on appreciating black women. I mean, period. But um, like I said, as always, we really appreciate you all for watching. Um, we want to know what you guys think about uh, sex education. Like, how do you think it should be incorporated in school? Do you believe that it is it's okay like it is? Do you think there should be a change? We want to have those discussions in comments and down below. So always keep the conversation going down in the comment box below. We do respond, we do read. As always, as always, you can follow me at Andre Talks A Lot on Instagram. You can follow Daquan at Daquan950. We are also available as a podcast. So please do not forget to rate and review our podcast on um, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcast. And please listen, girl, listen, li listen. Listen, like this video, comment on it, and listen to the podcast. You ain't gotta just right. just look, just press play and, and and rewind and then skip over to the end and then press play again. It'll count as time. All right. We appreciate. It. We appreciate it. Okay. Listen so, while you're um, looking. Listen while you're driving. <laughs> do whatever you need to do. Do whatever you need to do. We <laughs> but thank you all so much. And we will be back with you for one more episode next week. It is our last episode of season three. I'm season two, Daquan. It's almost season three. So if you have any suggestions for topics, leave those down as well. We definitely want to hear what you guys want to hear us talk about too. So, oh my God, we're going to see you all next week for the last episode of season two. Thank you so much for watching. We will see you next week, baby. Bye.